This is a picture of Maurice Drouin, the Honorary Perpetual Secretary of l'Académie Française, the French Academy. He is splendidly attired in his $68,000 uniform, uh, befitting the role of the French Academy as legislating the uh, correct uh, usage in French and perpetuating the language. The French Academy uh, has two main tasks. It compiles a dictionary of uh, official French. They're now working on their uh, ninth edition, which they began in 1930, and they've reached the letter P. Uh, they also legislate on correct usage, such as uh, the proper term for what the French call email, which ought to be uh, courriel, uh, the World Wide Web, the French are told, ought to be referred to as uh, le toile uh, d'araignée uh, mondiale, the global spider web, recommendations that the French uh, gaily ignore. Uh, now this is one model of uh, how language comes to be, namely it's legislated by uh, an academy, but anyone who looks at language realizes that this is a, uh, a rather silly conceit, that language rather emerges from human minds interacting from one another, uh, and this is visible in the unstoppable change in language, the fact that by the time the academy finishes their dictionary it will already be well out of date. We see it in the uh, constant uh, uh, appearance of slang and jargon, of historical change in languages, in divergence of dialects, and in the formation of new languages. So language is not so much a creator or shaper of human nature, so much as a window onto human nature. And uh, in uh, a book that I'm currently working on, I hope to use language to shed light on uh, a number of aspects of human, language, uh, human nature, including the cognitive machinery with which humans conceptualize the world and the relationship types that govern human interaction. And I'm going to uh, say a few words about each one this morning. Let me start off with a technical problem in language that I worried about for quite some time, and you'll uh, uh, indulge me in uh, my passion for verbs and how they're used. Uh, the problem is, uh, which verbs go in which constructions? The verb is the chassis of the sentence. It's the framework onto which the other parts are bolted. Uh, to give you a, a, a quick reminder of something that you've long for, forgotten, an intransitive verb such as dine, for, for example, can't take a direct object. You have to say Sam dined, not Sam dined the pizza. A transitive verb uh, mandates that there has to be an object there. Sam devoured the pizza. You can't just say Sam devoured. And there are uh, dozens or scores of verbs of this type, each of which shapes its sentence. So a problem in uh, explaining how children learn language, a problem in uh, teaching language to adults so that they don't make grammatical errors, a problem in programming computers to use language is which verbs go in which constructions. Uh, for example, the date of construction in English, you can say give a muffin to a mouse, the prepositional dative, or give a mouse a muffin, the double object dative, promise anything to her, promise her anything, and so on. Hundreds of verbs can go both ways. So attempting generalization for a child, for an adult, for a computer, is that any verb that can appear in the construction subject verb thing to a recipient can also be expressed as subject verb recipient thing. A handy thing to have because language is infinite. You can't just parrot back the sentences that you've heard. You've got to extract generalization so you can produce and understand new sentences. This would be an example of how to do that. Uh, unfortunately, there appear to be idiosyncratic exceptions. You can say Biff drove the, the car to Chicago, but not Biff drove Chicago the car. You can say Sal gave Jason a headache, but, but it's a little bit odd to say Sal gave a headache to Jason. The solution is that these constructions, despite initial appearance, are not synonymous, that when you crank up the microscope on human cognition, you see that there's a subtle difference in meaning between them. So give the x to the y, uh, that construction corresponds to the thought cause x to go to y, whereas give the y the x corresponds to the thought cause y to have x. Now many events 
uh, can be subject to either construal, kind of like the classic figure ground reversal illusions in which you can uh, either pay attention to the uh, particular object, in which case the space around it recedes from attention, or you can see the faces in the empty space, in which case the object uh, recedes out of consciousness. How are these construals reflected in language? Well, in both cases, the thing that is construed as being affected is expressed as the direct object, the noun after the verb. So when you think of uh, the event as causing the muffin to go somewhere, where you're doing something to the muffin, you say, give the muffin to the mouse. When you construe it as cause the mouse to have something, you're doing something to the mouse, and therefore you express it as give the mouse the muffin. So which verbs go in which construction, the, the, original, the problem with which I began, depends on whether the verb specifies a kind of motion or a kind of possession change. To give something involves both causing something to go and causing someone to have. To drive the car only causes something to go because Chicago is not the kind of thing that can possess something, only humans can possess things. And to give someone a headache causes them to have the headache, but it's not as if you're taking the headache out of your head and causing it to go to the other person and implant to get in them. You might just be you know, loud or obnoxious or some other way of causing them to have the headache. So. Um, that's uh, a, an example of the kind of thing that I do in my day job. So uh, why should anyone care? Well, there are a number of interesting conclusions, I think, from this and uh, many similar kinds of uh, analyses of uh, hundreds of English verbs. First, there's a level of fine-grained conceptual structure, which we automatically and unconsciously compute every time we produce or utter a sentence uh, that governs our use of language. You can think of this as the language of thought or mental ease. It seems to be based on a fixed set of concepts which governs dozens of constructions and thousands of verbs, not only in English but in all other languages. Uh, fundamental concepts such as space, time, causation, and human intention, such as what is a means and what is the ends. These are reminiscent of the kinds of categories that Immanuel Kant uh, argued are the basic framework for human thought, and it's interesting that our unconscious use of language seems to reflect these Kantian categories, doesn't care about perceptual qualities such as color, texture, weight, and speed, which virtually never differentiate the use of verbs in different constructions.